Welcome to Maximal Being, a GI doc and ICU nurse that break down the science so you can exceed your gut health, nutrition and fitness goals. So, let's smash the bro science and optimizing your health with your hosts, Doc Mock and RN Graham. What's going on, Maximal Beings? It's Doc Mock here with Maximal Being, and uh, this uh, kicks off podcast number seven. Um, I'm joined today by a very special guest down in Virginia, and of course, I'm Doc Mock, your uh, host. RN Graham was unable to make it today. He must be stuck taking care of COVID patients in the hospital. Um, again, I'm Doc Mock. I'm your host. I'm an advanced GI doctor. I specialize in cancer, nutrition, and gut health. I'm practicing in Cleveland, Ohio, originally from the East Coast, um, and love in Cleveland, definitely one of the most um, underrated cities in America. And then down in Virginia, I have the wonderful Stephanie Walker, who is the head of strongfigure.com. And just as a little aside for you folks, when I started on my fitness journey, one of the big people to inspire me um, on my journey was Stephanie. She, she led me away from the bro science that was out there and on the path to success with her initial book. And now she has Revamp Your Health, uh, which is available on Amazon.com. I highly encourage you if you're looking for, you know, starting your goal or, or to get to that next level to pick up her book and read it. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie. Well, hi, thanks for that uh, great introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, this is this is so exciting. This is this is fun. Um, I'm glad you invited me to be on your podcast. Um, it's so my pleasure. I guess uh, my backstory, if you want to know a little bit about uh, that or how Strong Figure came to be. Um, to. So really, what happened um, was I I grew up in a home that never really emphasized nutrition or exercise. I mean, we, we kind of lived out in the middle of nowhere and, you know, your exercise was any farm activity that had to be done. And uh, if you needed to lose weight, you would go on a diet. And that's, that's all I knew about health or fitness, nutrition. If you're sick, you went to the doctor, you know, it was just very cut and dry. And, um, when I got into college, you know, because I had grown up in such a small area, college for me was great. It was pizza every night. And uh, I, if you could believe this, I'd never had fettuccine Alfredo until I went to college. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And so I had it like every other night <laughs> for years. Um, so it was, you know, it was just living that way, not knowing anything about health. Um, and then when I graduated college, I had put on, I think what's called the sorority 40, even though I wasn't in a sorority. <laughs> um, and I think had, I put that on too at some point in time too. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so yeah. And I, I just, I had to figure out at that point, you know, I, I remember looking at myself in a picture my mom took and I thought, wow, this is, this was not what I am supposed to, this is not who I am. You know, it's not what I'm supposed to look like, or I didn't feel good. And I, let's just say I spent like my entire twenties trying to figure out what was the best way to work out and what was the best way to eat for me, um, which really led into the blogging. So that led into strongfigure.com. And then the blog led into like the physical location where we have our boot camp now and, and things kind of just exploded from there, like starting the blog, writing about my experiences and basically transforming my life, going from being like a high school teacher to now running um, fitness programming and, and blogging and just making my life about fitness and nutrition. So that's, that's me. That's your story right there. That that's really inspiring and, and amazing. And I have no doubt, you know, you've inspired myself as well as, you know, members of my family directly um, among with members of your community. So thank you for being out there. No, oh, thanks so um, much. Yeah. What do you think, you know, was the hardest thing for you to overcome when you started your journey? Um, you know, how did, how did you initiate that process? And, and how did you tell what was the, the bad science out there from, from what was the good stuff? I think the hardest thing really was um, figuring out the nutrition aspect of everything. You know, um, I'm one of those people that it, I, it's not easy for me to lose weight. So I had to work a little harder. You know, I couldn't just cut soda and, you know, pounds drop off or something. Um, 
and working out was always the easy part once I was there you know that was a huge commitment to actually start and go but once you know you do something like that for a while you get into the habit and so the habit was set but figuring out nutrition was the hardest part because there's so much wrong information out there and yes. you're you're taught to believe and even I thought it you know growing up you know if you want to lose weight or get fit you don't eat and you exercise really hard and so you know I started my journey trying to navigate food through Weight Watchers you know it was what I saw other people doing so I did it and I was you know I, I was eating 1200 calories a day and then going to the gym for an hour hour and a half and wow. you know on, on any diet you lose something initially but then you stop and it's at that point, it's learning how to be consistent or find something that works, you know, long-term that you can maintain versus yeah. just dieting. And, I, and that's what I did. I would diet and then yo-yo back and then try a new diet and yo-yo back. And so the hardest part for me is just figuring out myself and what works for me because we're all, we're all different, you know, and, and I can sit here and say like, no diet works for, you know, every one person, but some elements of different diets work better for different people, you know? Yes. So figuring out what worked best for me nutrition wise was a really challenging journey. And it, it took years, honestly. Yeah. And I, I think that's important for the people that are listening out there that it, you're not going to see results with anything that you can keep up over time within an eight week period or even, you know, a few months, it takes years of experimentation and seeing what works for you. Mm -hmm. And there are parameters that you can follow and, you know, in general, avoiding things that you can't pronounce if they're biochemistry, <laughs> avoid those, eat real food. Right. But from the other gray zone in there, how much to eat, what component of each macro to eat, should you, you know, inter do intermittent fasting, all these other things that you can do, it, it really does depend on the person. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where strongfigure.com and maximal being come in is because you, you know, definitely approach things by customizing it to your clients and we do mm -hmm. the same. Right. What do you think is the, the hardest thing when you're counseling somebody um, in convincing them that, you know, your way is the, is the way to go versus the conventional starve yourself and work yourself to mm -hmm. death? It's, no one believes it. Like that's, that's the hardest thing because when you tell someone look, you're eating 1200 calories and just to maintain like your human function, you need to be eating like 1400 calories and you're eating below that. And now you are working out on top of, you know, you're just, you're burning or you're trying to burn calories and your body doesn't have the calories to burn. Like people just don't believe you when you say you have to eat more. And that's yes. really, really frustrating for me. Yes. <laughs> you know, I, I know so many women, just badass women who are amazing and they're strong and, and lean and, you know, they just, they have one, one of those ideals and they're eating 23, 24, 2,500 calories a day, you know, it, and I'm like, it's doable, but so yep. many others don't believe that. Yeah. You got to fuel the engine. If, if mm -hmm. you're revving it up, you know, if you work hard, you, you also have to, to build that muscle back up that you've, mm -hmm. you've destroyed. Right. Um, so, you know, in talking about image, you know, everybody sees their own view of what they want to be. But, you know, I think um, one question that I had in looking up the research was what what is kind of the normative or most common appearances that people see on social media? And so Karote uh, did a study of social media accounts where they actually looked at the most common things on certain hashtags that were fitness oriented. And they saw the, exactly the same traps that we're talking about. Every single guy that was on there was way too muscular for what is probably healthy for them. And most women were way too trim and skinny and um, had limited muscle mass, at least that's what they quoted. And I thought a terrible thing was that they even said that, you know, it was very common for them not to even show the heads of these poor fitness models that they saw. So, you know, it just it makes you take a step back and, and wonder, you know, what, what are we really looking for in our body image goals? Um, so, you know, I think we would term that body dysmorphia, right? It's, it's somebody that's seeing something different in the mirror than what is, what is real. And in reading in it a little bit differently, I, I noted that 
there are certain types of dysmorphia that are specific to the fitness industry. One that's termed muscle dysmorphia, where people are obsessed with, with improving the muscle or building on their muscle muscular physique. And then there's also something called exercise dependence, where people are truly addicted physiologically to exercise. So, you know, how do you uh, approach a client that you think you're concerned about uh, their body image and, and what, what steps do you, you know, put into place to, to help them see them for who they are as a beautiful individual person? Oh, that one, that's hard. You know, I try to capture it as a group, you know, a lot of times like I'm working with groups of people. And so if I can spout out informational stuff during a training or just, um, you know, something positive that they may need to hear or even informational tidbits about nutrition, like, oh, make sure you refuel with this after this workout. It's the best time to eat such and such, you know, just trying to maybe start conversations through general talk, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, And then hoping I can get those people that I'm concerned about to open up a little bit more. Um, So I try to just throw out information like while I'm teaching if I have someone who, you know, comes to me personally, then that's a different story. We'll sit down and talk and, you know, I'll explain why we need to, you know, eat the way we need to eat or what our bodies are designed to do. Um, It's really, it's really hard one to answer, you know, because, and you don't always know what people are struggling with too. And sometimes you have to guess, you know, like I'll have, um, people coming in who I think should be really happy with themselves. And then I find out later that they're not, or that they're leaving my gym and going to another one to exercise more. And that's when I'm like, Oh, like something's going on here. Or even, um, I've experienced it with myself being overweight for many years, looking in the mirror and not being certain of what I see. I'm like, do I see myself as bigger? Do I, do I need to work harder to be smaller? Like, do people view me as bigger? And I know it shouldn't matter what other people think, but because I saw that for many years, I still look in the mirror and think, what, what is it that I see? Do I see muscle? Do I, you know what I mean? So it's, yeah. I have to counsel myself a lot of times and just be like, you're healthy, you're strong, you're fine. You're, you're doing what you need to do, but yeah. it's, it's really hard and you don't want to yeah. offend people, mm-hmm. you know? It, it's hard to it's hard to undo you know years of psychological trauma or psychological programming that's been impacted by studies like the first one that we talked about and i I just think you know like my my approach as a healthcare provider is to gingerly you know try to discuss that with people about them seeing a mental health professional knowing when to to mm-hmm. refer out to somebody that can talk to them about that because some people will interpret that as us telling them that they're crazy, but that's not necessarily the case. Right. We're just trying to, to help other needs that perhaps yep. we can't uh, fulfill. I see it a lot with the talk about the scale. Mm-hmm. And I guess because I'm a woman, people will come to me and be like, the scale isn't budget. And, and women are obsessed with weight. Like they're obsessed with the number. And so I do a lot of counseling with people and it's just off the fly, like after a class or something. But I, I sometimes have to sit down with a lot of women and be like, the scale, the number on the scale does not define who you are. And that's really yes. frustrating. And you're a doctor, so maybe you can tell me why, <laughs> why do doctors measure the, the body mass? So why did they take that number so heavily? Like I, yeah. even at my leanest and strongest, if you go by my BMI, I'm overweight. You know, yeah, like, I, I'm overweight right now, according to BMI, <laughs> but I'm not, you know, right, <laughs> like, right, right, right. And so and, and people get so upset by that when they see that or they go to the doctor and the doctor says, well, this is your BMI, you're overweight. And I'm like, you're building muscle, you're strong. Like, you know, I have women in my gym who can sling around a 50 pound kettlebell, like it's nothing. And then they get upset because the number on the scale doesn't match what a chart says it should. And yes. I, I don't know, that's, that's really frustrating. And yeah, I mean, you it's know, I know it's not yeah. the number, but convincing a million women that, you know? Yes, it, it's hard. And and I have patients that come to me all the time. They don't want to step on the scale first thing when they come into the office, which I, I measure it only if I have to do a, 
you know, a weight, um, that weight-based medicine. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's not a great measure. It's, you know, if you're somebody that's not six foot two, um, you know, and, and you are muscular build, you're going to be in that obese or overweight category. Right. I think it's, it's a measure of, you know, we, we talked about this on podcast number two is, you know, should you trust your doctor's nutrition advice and doctors just don't know any better. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, about 50% of healthcare providers, um, are struggling with, you know, their own, uh, health and fitness goals. And so they don't necessarily know, you know, what the best metrics are for, for themselves. So how, how can they measure that for their patients? And only 20% of medical schools teach any sort of, you know, true nutrition curriculum. So, you know, again, uh, even within those nutrition curriculums, there's probably weight is emphasized time and time again to just mm -hmm. meet those numbers. But you're right, you know, we need to teach people to get away from the scale and to get away from just worrying about the numbers. Yeah. Um, how often do you, you know, what other metrics do you tell people to follow and, and how often do you have them check them? So we are really lucky um, where we live. There is a nutrition store, um, kind of like a nutrition supplement store, five star nutrition, and they have this amazing scale. It's like a $10,000 scale and you go in and you step on it and you hold these handles and it tells you your um, BMR. It gives you your total uh, muscle mass, your uh, fat mass, tells you how much muscle you have in each leg, each arm, your trunk, like just it gives you a real good reading. And um, it tracks your progress too. So at the bottom of your chart, when they print it out, it, it tracks every time you've been in and how much muscle mass you've improved or lost and vice versa. And I tell people, go to this place, get on this scale and look at your body fat percentage, because that's the number that if you want to lose weight, you want to just decrease your body fat percentage. And then so many people go in and they'll see that, you know, their actual weight stayed the same or it only dropped by two pounds, but they gained four pounds of muscle and lost like, I don't know, 5% body fat. I don't know if that mm -hmm. adds up the way it's supposed to, but it's crazy that they'll be like, wow, I've transformed. I've gone down two sizes and I have this much more muscle. Oh, my weight didn't change, but suddenly they're okay with it. You yep. know, like they see they're getting stronger and leaner. And so I tell people, if you can find a place like that, that you can get a reliable like body fat test done, track that once a month if you can. Because to me, yeah. that's, that's more, way more realistic and accurate and reliable than just the scale that might tell you you're up five pounds today because you had a dinner that had too much salt in it the night before, you know? Yes. Yeah. Pe I think people get excited when they start on, say, the ketogenic diet that they've lost five pounds in two days. But what they don't know is that, you know, glycogen, carbohydrates in the stored form, right, are, are just, they attract water. So the minute you dump your glycogen stores, you're also dumping that high percentage of water in your body. And that weight that's seen as a win is really just water. And right. when they gain the weight back a few weeks later, they're totally pissed. Yeah. So you know, that that's, I'm with you. I think body fat is a really good uh, objective measure. What do you think about measuring like arm circumference, leg circumference, those sorts of metrics? I've always read that it's a really good test. Um, I've never done it on myself, but I just go by clothes and how my clothes fit. Like I can tell if my shirt mm -hmm. sleeves are too tight or, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. or, or whatever. But, and usually I, then I just say, oh, look, my arms got more muscular. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. But, but yeah, I, I think a lot of people like that. Um, when I've done challenges, like, you know, whole 30 challenges or just basic nutrition challenges, um, mm -hmm. we do a lot of measurements just to see more visual results. Um, and, and just to have more numbers because numbers, you know, those types of numbers are much more accurate than necessarily, you know, the scale, but yeah. Yeah. I think it's good. It, especially if you don't have access to, one of those scales that will tell you your body fat percentage. Yeah. I, and, and I think, um, you know, people do get obsessed with those metrics as well, right? They say mm -hmm. my jeans don't fit anymore and they get upset or they say that my shirt doesn't fit anymore and they get upset. And again, with that programming that we have because of whatever dysmorphia is going on, we, we don't realize that it could be, you're also gaining muscle or muscle. Uh, you ate something mm -hmm. that has a little bit 
more water in it or more salt that's retaining water. Mm -hmm. um, you know, looking again at the research, so, you know, things that have helped people with known dysmorphic disorders, there was a study that was done in 2013, um, where they, they determined that, uh, and I found this to be really interesting, that an emphasis on macronutrition um, mm -hmm. was important. I think macronutrition is a great thing to teach to clients. Um, and they also talked about rebuilding your gut and your liver health, um, which obviously, you know, struck me as a GI doc. Right. What do you think? I mean, do you ever talk to your patients about GI diseases with training? Or I mean, do, do a lot of your clients mention GI things in concert with it? You know, we talk about gut health just very generically. Um, it's something that I only learned maybe in the past few years that how important gut health really was. Um, and you're the doctor, so don't quote me on this, but I know that the bacteria you have in your gut is connected to your brain somehow. Yes. Yep. So like the things that you eat, like I tell, I do tell people all the time, I'm like, you have to have good gut health. You have to clear out all of the bad crap you've been eating and start getting your vegetables in there, start getting all of your fermented foods and, and create some good gut health so that it tells your brain that you want more of those foods versus just yeah. eating more of the crap all the time. And so I, we do talk about yep. that in passing a little bit, but yep. Yep. That's kind of the extent I know. I know a lot of the COVID cases, they're, they're saying improved gut health can make a better outcome. Um, yeah. But I don't know the science behind that and how that works. But I do. Yeah, know I mean, absolutely. Yeah, you're talking about the brain gut access. And so, you know, there is a direct link between your central nervous system and your, your enteric nervous system, the nerves that fire your gut serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, all the same things that, that make us depressed, angry, anxious, all those things also make your gut move and shake. And so when one is out of balance, the other inevitably will be. And the percentage of bacteria of certain types that you have it will change based upon what you eat. Some of that is genetically predetermined or you know geographically predetermined, and some is given during the birthing process. So you can't change those things. But our diet definitely impacts that as well. And and I have noticed this personally, I mean, in my own journey, that as I've gotten away from anything that's processed, that my I don't crave that stuff anymore. I just crave good food. And I actually will crave vegetables. And, you, you know, your body will start to tell you. And it's those bugs in your belly that are telling you those things. Yeah. Another, another interesting thing that they talked about was an emphasis on real food without supplements. So, mm -hmm. you know, everybody wants to take that magic pill that will help them to lose weight or gain muscle or anything like that. Do you recommend any supplements for your clients, you know, that, that you actually believe in, or do you think they're all bro science? Um, I think that taking fish oil is really important. Um, vitamin D, I read some studies that say vitamin D supplementation isn't as great as what we think it is, but I know they test it on women um, all the time in yearly checkups and that it can have a huge impact on um, mood and energy. So I, I do take vitamin D. Um, I do take a B complex supplement. Um, I have noticed that I am much happier and less anxious and moody when I have all the B vitamins in place. And then as far as like your, typical gym supplementation. I do usually take a protein powder, either a protein mm -hmm. powder or a collagen, um, mainly because I know it's so important to hit protein goals every yep. day. And yeah. it's really hard to eat that much sometimes. And a scoop mm -hmm. of protein really helps. And then um, BCAAs, the branch chain amino acids are a hot topic. Um, yes. Some people will say that if you're eating a well-balanced diet, you don't need them. Um, others say, what harm can it do? And I'm kind of in the, you know, it, I don't think it can cause any harm if you're taking BCAAs. I know they help you with your um, protein uh, recovery and um, muscle recovery in the gym. They can provide energy when you're working out. So I tell people, you know, they ask many times, like, should I be taking BCAAs? If you want to, sure. You know, I don't think it can harm anything, um, but that's about it. I'd say fish oil, vitamin D, a B vitamin, B complex, 
protein if you can't hit your goal with food. And then mm-hmm. if you really want the amino acids for that extra energy boost, that's, that's pretty much where I draw the line. So yeah, I, I feel like that. we're, yeah, same page again, like, you know, for sure, a protein supplement, I, I believe in those products, most of them are milk based, right? Mm-hmm. So people with lactose intolerance may have somewhat of a difficulty with them. Mm-hmm. But there are pea based products or soy based products there are a bajillion different products. There's fish based protein powders. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. That's that's really interesting. I tried a salmon protein powder. <laughs> How once. was that? It was tropical punch flavored, I think. Um, mm. I don't think it was bad, but I knew it was salmon that I was drinking and I, I couldn't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was just weird. Yeah. And and I, I totally agree with you in terms of omega-3 fatty acids. We wrote an article on this recently. Um you know, the American diet in particular is just lacking severely in Mm omega-3s. Most people go to nuts, but if you look at the omega-6 to omega-3 ratios, it's really hard to get a good ratio with any sort of legume or nut, which leaves fish. And all the fish here in America is grown on farms for the most part, unless you go out to Alaska, which is wild caught. And without, you know, it being able to swim free and eat algae and krill, you know, these fish are fed, fed grains like our right. cattle are. And so they right. just don't have omega-3s. So I, I supplement with omega-3s as well. Um, and Stephanie, there was a really great systematic review that came out at the beginning part of this year looking at omega-3s. And not only does it improve health outcomes like prevent macular degeneration, Alzheimer's, but it also led to improved VO2 max for cyclists, for, for weight yeah. training athletes, and led to improved uh, recovery. Um, the BCAAs, I agree, is very debatable. Um, so yeah, it can't harm you, but may not help you as much as, as we think it does. Right. And, and a lot of protein products also have a lot of BCAAs in them right. as well. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so we talked about protein a little bit. Um, is protein going to make you fat if you have too much of it? Or <laughs> is it going to hurt your kidneys or your bones? Oh, or No. Um, you know... It is so hard to eat the amount of protein it would take to do that type of damage, I believe. Yeah. Um, I just, I I don't know. I've been studying nutrition for 15, 18 years, something like this. And I I still have a hard time eating enough protein for my five foot frame. So I really don't see someone eating so much protein that they're going to put themselves into um, kidney failure. Um, when people ask about it, you know, I just say, drink a lot of water. If you are really concerned, yes, you are probably fine. Drink a lot of water so that it helps your kidneys process it. And, and, and I think you're fine. When I tell people the amount of protein that I would, you know, advise them to eat if I were working on their macros, they're usually shocked. I'm like, well, I can't eat that much protein in a day. And then I'm like, well, yep. you're not doing any harm right now. So, right. so yeah, protein is. Yeah, it's one of those hot topics too. Yeah, protein will not hurt your kidneys, people. If you have functioning kidneys, they are perfectly capable of filtering out the excess. You may notice that your urine is a little foamy, right? That's the excess protein if you've eaten more than you really need for that day. Um, It's not going to get stored as fat as easily as carbohydrates uh, will. So your body has to actually work a little bit harder to, to store that as fat than anything else. Um, we were talking uh, about uh, approaches to weight loss in clients as well. And, um, you know, the, the evidence has started to suggest that uh, de-emphasizing weight loss as a goal is a really great way to improve people's body image. That was Holman in 2014. Um, but we also found some interesting studies looking at, you know, walking versus weightlifting and aerobic training versus weightlifting. So do you kind of tailor your strategy for people? Do you use weightlifting for every client or, you know, do you, do you look, is there, are there things that you ask your clients um, to, to work on their body image goals? Yes, this is, this is huge for me. So we, I incorporate weights as much as possible. If, if a client comes to me and says, I can't squat because I have a knee injury or something, that's, that's fine. We're going to work on fixing the knee injury and doing air squats and, you know, just building back up until they can hold the weight in their hands. Um, but, but yeah, I think to, 
take away from, okay, like let's, let's not focus on the weight that you want to lose. Let's just focus on getting healthy. Right. So let's train for something or let's focus on building some muscle to keep you uh, active as you age or, you know, take this shift from the number on the scale to let's transform your body because really that's what people want. If they want to lose weight, they want to transform their body. Well, what does that muscle, you know, lifting weights, yep. putting on muscle and muscle burns fat. So if you want to lose fat, you got to build muscle. It's just, I feel like weight training is so important. And, you know, I can even, there are some people who come in who are skeptical of it. They think they're just going to bulk up and get huge. And, you know, for women, most women, you would have to go on steroids to get to that size that they think they're going to get to by lifting mm -hmm. muscle. Most women, the more they can lift, the smaller they're going to get. And then for the older population too, um, you know, I did this class, um, this training with, uh, teaching elderly clients and they told us if someone 65 and older has a fall and it's a serious fall, like they break a hip or leg and, and you, you know, hear about this happening a lot. 50% of those adults will die within the year from that fall. And the number one thing that could have saved them from the fall is a healthy amount of muscle mass. So it's yes. like, even if you can put your thoughts about the scale aside, lift weights for a healthy muscle mass so that you can live longer. You know, yes. that's, you can tell I'm probably very passionate about it, but yeah. And having, and, having muscle is just so important. Sorry. Go and on. it's so fun to lift heavy things isn't yes. it? or even, even light things. A lot of times it's all just fun. When, when you see like this smile on someone's face, when they lifted something, they didn't think that they could. And all of a sudden they realize they're strong and they're capable Like that transfers to everything out there in the world. You know, you just Absolutely. did something you didn't think you could do. Now you're just on top of your game and you're ready to do a ton of things you didn't think you could do, you know? Yeah. You're ready to take on the world for sure. Um, yeah. There, there have been studies that have been done on the elderly to look at how to improve muscle. The, you know, the nutritional societies recommend very low protein intake for people. Um, so there was a study that came out this year as well, where they looked at higher, you know, protein intakes for the older people and they had less falls and, and traumatic injury as, as a result of higher protein intake. So at least that one gram per pound of body weight is really what should be recommended versus 0.5 to one gram per kilogram, which is, right. you know, pounds really by two by two. Yeah. yeah, that's really low. And I, I totally agree with you that you know, weight training also important for, for older population. The, these studies that we pulled, you know, in terms of uh, people working on, you know, their body image, weight training was better than walking alone for improving people's body image. And I think it was for the reasons that you're talking about, that they mm -hmm. felt that sense of personal accomplishment and also built lean muscle mass. And then they're also, this was interesting though, was a study in 46 women, they had them do aerobic exercises versus weight training uh, that was by uh, Martin Guinness in 2014. And what they found was that actually the aerobic improved their body comp composition uh, mindset a, a little bit better. You know, the, the problem with a lot of these studies, Stephanie, is that there, there is just a lot of problems with the way that they arrange them and, and the metrics that they're looking at. So it's once you get into the depth and the meat of these studies, you know, reading the headline doesn't always mean it's gospel. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, we're both aligned in our views of uh, weight training and its role in improving people's body images. Right. And I read that study and I know, mm -hmm. I know what it feels like to do a really good aerobic exercise, you know, like getting out there and just, you know, I tailor a lot of our workouts that we do to incorporate both the aerobic side of things, but with the weights. And so we can feel, you know, a little bit of, of everything. Like we lifted something heavy, but then we did some sprints and we, you know, just got our heart rates up and got a good sweat. And I feel like so many people want that runner's high, you know what I'm mm -hmm. talking about? So yep. a lot of times I will combine the strength with the cardio to produce that same feeling like of elation of like what I just accomplished and you're sweating mm -hmm. and you're breathing hard. And while I think that strength training and walking is probably fine for most people, 
some people have to have that feeling of just burnout. Like they just ran so many miles or they biked so many miles or they, you know, they need that sweat, that heart racing feeling because it doesn't feel like they did enough without it. And they get that sense of accomplishment and that confidence that comes with that, you know, similar to the strength training. So I think a lot of people sometimes don't necessarily need as much of it as they might be doing, Mm -hmm. but mentally think that they do. Yeah. Well, if you want, yeah, if you want to do weights and feel like you had a great workout and really burn a lot of energy, the strongfigure.com bootcamp, (laughs) oh man, they will kick your butt and and you're going to feel great at the end of it. So Uh, I've definitely done some of your workouts. They are amazing. So thank you for that. Oh, you're so welcome. Yeah. Stephanie, do you have any parting thoughts regarding our topic? And I just wanted to go through a few pieces of listener mail once once we wrap up here. Um, So parting thoughts on, uh, you know, body image in the fitness world. It's, it's so tough because you are constantly working on your body image, no matter where you are. If you are just starting, you know, you have a goal. And once you get there, you realize you've done something. You usually have a new goal. And you're always comparing yourself to someone in the gym. I mean, this is my experience, at least with a lot of women. You know, there's always someone to compare yourself to. There's always social media telling you what you should look like. Um, Even, I know with my experience, like going from being just a gym member to then a fitness instructor to then a programmer, there's always someone above you that you can look to for either inspiration or comparison. And so, we really just have to keep in mind that we are doing our best to be strong and healthy individuals for ourselves and where we are in our journey is where we are and we need to appreciate that moment, you know? So speaking for a lot of women, it is super hard to stay out of that comparison trap. But if we are doing something every day to better ourselves and our health, like we're winning and it's, it's consistency and it's patience. It takes a lot of that, but it's, it's doable. And we don't have to constantly say, well, I don't look like her or I'm not lifting that weight. I'm not good enough, but like we are in our journey in our process right here. And we need to be more appreciative of that than just upset because we haven't reached a goal yet or we don't look like someone else. So that's, that's one big takeaway that I think is really important. People need to hear. That is so beautifully put. And thank you again, Stephanie. Stephanie. So our first piece of uh, listener mail comes from Kim. And, uh, you know, we had uh, recently done a podcast on sleep. So she asks, do you use any particular devices to track your sleep? I'm going to hand this over to you first. Um, Um, I use my Fitbit. And I, I know there are devices out there that are a little bit more accurate And I know if you participate in sleep studies, they'll give you some really nifty hookups. But um, I I use my sleep uh, or my Fitbit and I feel like it's pretty accurate. Like I know how many times I'm up in the night with a baby. So I can look at it in the morning and be like, yep, I was up at two. I was up at four. (laughs) He got up again at 630. And I I see it. So I'm, I'm, you know, fairly certain that for a non-expensive device, it works pretty well. So that's what I use. Yeah, I think it. I think using uh, common devices, there are rings that you can use to track. You, you can use watches as well. What they're looking at is your uh, heart rate variability, and also your pulse ox sometimes, which are some good surrogate markers to things like sleep apnea. But it's not the end all be all. Um, there was a book that was written last year by Christy Ash- Ashwender, and it's called Good to Go. And she ha- writes this chapter about a woman physician that was worried about her sleep because she had been tracking it on one of these apps. And so, you know, when she was counseling her, she's like, okay, let's do a real sleep study. The physician went in and did really well on the sleep study, no sleep problems at all. But then she went back to the the app and was noticing her sleep was terrible. So she started worrying and then the anxiety turned into a real sleep disorder. So I think, I think it's important to just realize that these are surrogate markers and not obsess over the results. If you want a real result, you 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 need to have an EEG monitor that's a, a brain wave monitor hooked up to your head. And the only way to do that right now is not at home. It's it's <laughs> in a doctor's office. So, you know, I think if you're getting good results, great. But, you know, if you're having a true sleep disorder, please see a medical professional. 
The next question comes from Willard, um, and he was asking, why do people get lactose intolerance? Um, so this is definitely a, a, like a gut health sort of question, but- I was gonna say, I hope uh, you answer this because I didn't even look into this. I'm like, yeah. this, is, this is your alley right here. <laughs> yeah, but you, you shared with me uh, a few weeks ago, a really interesting article on like ancestral health in, in relation to lactose intolerance. So tell, mm -hmm. tell me what that was showing. Oh gosh, I don't even remember. Yeah, it, <laughs> I it, remember reading it and thinking, oh, this is really interesting. I'm going to yeah. send this. And then, no, I don't even, I don't even remember. Yeah, well, I, I remember asking you a bunch of questions about dairy. Yeah, and it's it's really dairy. interesting as a, as a species, we've kind of like evolved a genetic mutation to be able to break down milk sugars or lactose, which is galactose and glucose, right? But at different points in time in people's lives, that gene will turn off and they'll go back to default way that we were designed to go, which is not being able to break it down. That leaves a sugar that's inside of your intestinal tract and the bacteria, especially if you have the bad stuff, they ferment that sugar and that makes gas. And the gas is what leads to the downstream effects of lactose intolerance. Um, so the reason why people get it over time is because this gene will just turn off randomly in people. Now there are some people that will have a viral illness and then develop lactose intolerance. And they think it's due to changes in their ability to break it down in their small intestine. Um, but the mechanism is not fully uh, known. If you have lactose intolerance or you think you might have lactose intolerance, a stool pH is an okay test, but really the best test, just stop it for six weeks. That's milk, cheese, ice cream, and yogurt most of the time and see how you feel. And if you feel better, you have lactose intolerance. <laughs> um, you explain that so easy to understand. Oh, thank you. I feel like, well, I do it like all day, every day. <laughs> That's your, so. your thing. You should, <laughs> so I'm like, I really get that now. I, yeah. I can explain it to other people. All right. Okay. Yeah. And, and uh, people that have lactose intolerance also watch out for your nutritional supplements. We talked about a lot of uh, casein protein in particular, as well as whey will both be lactose derived. So you may need to seek some sort of alternative uh, supplement. Salmon protein. Yeah. <laughs> Stephanie, this, this was, uh, this was amazing to have you on. I, I really appreciate your time. I know that you have not only a busy work schedule, you're a badass online, you're running boot camps, you're writing amazing articles. Um, but you. tell, tell everybody out there where they can find you. And, um, so I think the easiest place to find me, I created um, a page on our website. If you go to strongfigure.com backslash maximal being, we've got yeah. everything you need to know. So I put up links to our books, links to um, the online programming that we have now up, um, where to find me. I'm on Instagram. You could look me up as strong figure underscore stuff. Um, we were at strong figure bootcamp. So we're just, if you look up strong figure, you'll find me, but strongfigure.com backslash maximal being everything you need is there. I even put in um, a free uh, some free recipes there. So listeners can go grab some free recipes. Um, all sorts of goodies are there. So yeah, her, her tacos are, oh my God, they're amazing. <laughs> so definitely check that out. So thank you so much, Stephanie. This was a wonderful episode. Um, I, you, you know, we'll, we'll definitely stay in touch and look forward to having awesome. you on sometime again. And uh, hopefully all of you will work on not comparing yourself to others, getting stronger mm -hmm. because you want to and maximizing your health. Until next time, this is Doc Mock. <laughs>